um, but have worked with PBIS developing PBIS programs from the ground up for um, the last five years. So my role within Interboro is, um, my title essentially is the pre-K through eighth grade behavior manager. So I do go across the nine grades or 10 grades actually supporting, um, all, you know, teachers, support staff, admin, um, with students who are struggling behavior-wise, um, could be both in gen ed and special ed. Um, and then my other role is also to be the district PBIS coach. Um, and with that, we'll, you know, we'll talk about my roles as a district coach. Um, I did make a little visual just so that you guys could see um, kind of how the district was set up. So if you see in the center how it says district coach myself, and I do that with one other person, um, the director of people services, she's actually my boss. So um, we communicate regularly about what's going on within each school. Um, and then you can see underneath how there's six schools within our school district. Um, there's the kindergarten center that houses both the pre-K and kindergarten. And then we have four community schools, um, Glen Olden, Norwood, Prospect Park, and Tinicum. And they house um, both elementary and middle school from grades one through eight. And then the Interboro High School as well that has grades nine through 12. Um, and then each, each building houses like one that does autistic support, one is emotional support, one does life skills. Um, there's actually two that, do, that does autistic support. One is more of like a high functioning, the other is a lower functioning. Um, and then you can see on top of us is a DCIU PBIS facilitator. So essentially we use the DCIU facilitator as our go-to person when we have questions that we're not necessarily sure um, how to answer ourselves. So they're there as a resource for us. Um, we meet with, with her probably about once a month, maybe once every two months, but I am in contact with her often just to kind of bounce ideas or get, you know, some questions answered. Um, then as a district coach, what I do is I hold monthly meetings with all of the tier one universal coaches um, in each building, as well as all of the administration in each building. Um, and then during those meetings each month, we kind of just give updates about what each school is doing. Um, if there's anything, you know, any specific updates from the DCIU that we need to kind of facilitate out, we'll do that. Um, and generally just kind of like ideas sharing and uh, they can ask questions. It's, it's very interactive. They can converse back and forth. Um, give ideas back and forth. And then just a, a little bit about their PBIS team. So each of them actually created their own program. So it's essentially like six different programs like within the, the district. The um, and so they each have their own tier one team. They have one universal coach um, in each building. Then they also, each school has their own tier two representative. So we just started moving into tier two this year, um, which you know is, is a little bit more specific. And then um, the schools all have monthly meetings as well within themselves. So I'll go once in a while, but based on my schedule, I'm not able to get to every single one. So what they do is they fill out a, um, it's kind of like the tips, but it's not as intricate. I'll say that and I can share that with Ron what we use if he wants to put it out to people to be able to use as well. Um, and then that just gets shared back to myself and the other district coach, um, just so that we can, you know, keep track of what's going on and seeing uh, where they're struggling. Um, just kind of keep track of um, You know, making sure that their attendance is staying up and things like that. Um, and then the administration attends both monthly meetings. So for, if, for example, if Glenn Olden is having their monthly meeting, Glenn Olden's um, admin will attend that. And then they also would attend my district coach meeting as well. 
Um, so it says, one of the questions says, do the tier one and tier two coaches also teach? Yes. So our tier one and tier co two coaches are, so tier one, we have a mix of teachers and actually we have two counselors as well. Um, and then the tier two coaches, same thing, uh, mainly teachers. And then some we have with a little bit more like behavioral expertise. So you'll have um, a psychologist or a counselor um, as well. Uh, will these slides be available? Yes, I can give you this slide. Ron has access to it too, so we can send that out. Um, and really this is like the only slide that I'm using because I want it to be a little bit more interactive. You guys can ask questions. Um, another question is, will you eventually have a tier three coach and team? Yes. Um, eventually, as you know, with PDIS, there's a system in place for that. So we have to kind of work our way up the tiers. So we've been implementing tier one with Fidelity for quite some time now. So we really started pushing tier two this year. Um, based on COVID and all the other craziness going on, we probably won't have a solid, solid tier two plan until probably next school year. But that being said, we did create the team and um, we're going to be starting to meet within the next month actually to start putting um, like the forms and things like that together. That way when we do have the means to start, um, we're ready to go and there's no kind of lag for the students that necessarily need it. Um, can I share my email? Yes, I will put it in the chat right now. Um, Okay, and um, so the tier one and tier two teams, I'm kind of there as a resource. They're familiar with me just because I'm in and out of the buildings anyway, working with a lot of the students. Um, so they'll shoot me an email or they'll call me if they have questions. So I'm there really as a resource for them. Um, if they need extra support, I go and, and do that. <clears throat> for example, one of the schools before winter break did kind of like a Chick-fil-A lunch for those students that um, you know, have been following, following the rules and earning their gold coins and things like that. So I went there and helped facilitate that with them. Um, but generally the schools the, and the teachers and the support staff do a really good job of kind of keeping it moving. I know in our monthly meetings lately, a lot of the concern has just been that the teachers are generally overwhelmed this year, which I think everybody can attest to that, that this year has been a lot worse than people expected it to be. Um, so I'm kind of there too as the cheerleader to just tell them to keep going. Um, I pull the data for the behaviors across the district and try to just focus on, you know, the good that PBIS is doing because, you know, it really does do good. Um, sometimes teachers think like, oh, it's one more thing that I have to do, but once it gets flowing, um, it starts to become more natural and everybody really works together with it. So if for those schools and teachers and educators that are kind of in the first few years, my advice is to keep trucking because it does get easier. Um, I, like I mentioned previously, I've started PBIS programs from the ground up and those first couple of years are generally very difficult and it's a uphill battle for sure. Um, but it does plateau, so I do promise that. Um, is there any questions so far about how this is organized? And then one question that I have, um, from do you have as a district, district-wide expectations or do the buildings have their own building expectations or how does that look? Yeah, that's a good question. So. They all have their own. So there are six PBIS programs within the district. So one with for each school. Um, they wanted to give each school the ability to create their own. That way, you know, there was more buy-in. Um, and it's just, it's better for them. It's more, it makes it more their own. Um, that being said, the district coach then has to learn six different programs. Um, but again, that's part of my job. So it, Again, it comes, comes naturally and easily as you start just interacting more. Um, Joseph, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, um, 
Hi, Shannon. Hi. Uh, quick question. Um, I, I'm at the initial stages of looking at uh, district-wide coaching development. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious, what, you might have answered this already, but you know. Um, so my question is really, which came first? Um, so did all of your school buildings that you have here, um, were they already implementing a tier one system and then you looked at doing district wide or did you approach this as, hey, we're gonna start at district wide, district wide coach and implement across the schools from there? So it kind of naturally fell into place, to be honest with you. It started in um, a couple of the schools. So it wasn't district wide. It started in a couple of the schools and they piloted um, the program. And as you know, that kind of took off and grew, other schools started doing it as well. Because, And I feel like within the last probably decade, PBIS has gotten a lot more a lot more famous, I'll say, um, for for lack of a better word. But so so no, it kind of took on that role. Um, my boss, who was also the district coach, the director of people services, she used to be a principal. So it kind of naturally grew into that as she moved up the ladder as well, um, since she really did help facilitate the beginning of PBIS within the district school. And then it grew from there. So no, it didn't start as a district coach model. Perfect, thank you. Sure. Um, there's another question. How do you split your roles percentage wise? Best guess is fine. I would say the main part of my job would probably be like the behavior manager side where I am in and out of the classrooms, really like supporting hands on the teachers with the specific students. That being said, because PBIS has been a part of Interbarrow for so long, um, like the behavioral expectations are really hey. dug, dug deep. Yeah, I go into. So percentage wise, I, it's hard to split it up, to be honest with you, because I don't know really where one ends and the other begins because PBIS is so intertwined within their just general expectations within every classroom, which is good. Um, but I do spend more time like hands-on with the kids and the teachers versus like facilitating as a district coach. Um, can you talk about interventions used at each tier? Sure, so tier one is, as you know, universal. So essentially you're supposed to give that to every single child um, within your building. So that would be like your general expectations that are, that are explained within the matrix. Um, and then from there, you start kind of going up the, the chain. So really tier one is just your, your expectations. You'll have like your monthly, like pep rally type meetings with the kids. Um, they do a lot of like shout outs as far as using um, like newsletters or the, the principal does shout outs as far as like students of the month, things like that. Um, so generally tier one is just what everybody gets. Um, a couple of the schools do like gold coins, for example. So if they earn gold coins throughout the day for um, modeling the expectations, a couple times a week, there's like a gold cart, gold coin cart that comes around and they're able to train, trade in the gold coins for like little trinkets or candy, things like that. So that would be the tier one. Um, and then for tier one, it's supposed, it's supposed to work for 80% of your students. And then once you get into tier two, that's your students that are struggling a little bit more. So right now for tier two, what we're doing is um, social skills groups. So targeted social skills groups, with like specific skills. Um, that's also part of my role. I do, I kind of travel to some of the schools that are in need of somebody else to lead social skills groups. So I do that. Um, and then we also have the check-in, check-out model that we started. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the check-in, check-out, that's generally for students who have the function of attention. 
So if your students don't have the attention function, the check it check out system would not work. Um, the social skills is a general like good good support for those students that just need a little extra explicit instruction in you know how to how to act socially around other adults or other students that sort of thing. Um, and then tier three, general we're not there yet for PBIS, but generally tier three are your like IEP kids um, or those that are pulled for ex like really special instruction. Um, so that would be your smaller groups, um, your smaller math groups, your targeted ELA groups, um, and again, just more intricate social skills groups. Shannon, are your buildings also um, implementing MTSS academics in a tiered model? So they used to. They've recently moved away from that model. Um, that's something that I know the teachers are not happy with, to be honest with you. Um, they moved away from the MTSS and more into um, they've done like block scheduling and things like that. I know recently they um, hired a couple teachers to start doing targeted math groups again. So I know they're happy about that. Um, so again, that would that would be like a tier two, tier three intervention is the targeted math groups. Um, Excuse this interruption. This is just a reminder. Yeah. <laughs> So um, PBS, PBIS is kind of a standalone on its own yeah. program, not really integrated within the academics, MTSS, meaning you don't have like one MTSS team looking at both academics and PBIS. Correct. Um, they do run, you know, the SAP teams and the child study teams. And like I said, PBIS has been, you know, a part of Interbarrow for so long at this point that I feel like it's naturally embedded with all of that. Um, part of my job too is when, you know, a student starts having some difficulty, what I do is, you know, go in and observe. Um, and a lot of times the stuff that I kind of hone in on are your tier one intervention. So they're the, um, you know, reteaching of the expectation. Sometimes the kids, especially the young ones now with, with be going through the pandemic, um, they haven't really had access to a school setting it for the most part. Um, in the last two years, that's been typical. So that means your kids that are first, second grade have not had those years behind them in kindergarten, first grade, even pre-K. Um, to really learn how to be a student. So a lot of times we have to remember that and say, hey, we have to start over again um, and start with the basics because it's true. I mean, our kids for the most part have not had a normal school year in two years. So that definitely has been a struggle. And I know our kindergarten center, um, you know, are generally seeing kids who are functioning like a two or three year old. Um, and if you think about it, that makes sense with the last couple of years. Um, but again, that makes it hard when you're doing interventions because more, more kids than your 15 to 20% are gonna need, you know, more, like more than just a universal intervention. So we've kind of had to get get tricky with that, with <laughs> pulling in other people to help do some of the social skills groups or one-to-one -one instruction. Um, our admin has been really great. They jump in everywhere. Um, they sub everywhere. They run groups. They do different curriculums with their teachers. Um, so that is one thing is that our admin is very, very hands-on. And I do know that that's a, that's a big help. And that is not something that I've seen in my past at previous places of, that I've worked. So I do kudos to Interborough's admin for doing that and really honestly putting the students first. I think that brings up a great point. Um, in the district coach model within Interborough, 
how do you have, you know, you mentioned the administrative support. I think sometimes um, administrators can be protective of their buildings. Yeah. Have you run into any, you know, pushback from buildings on a district model or something that you've shared from a district standpoint? Um, and just how did you work through that, I guess? Yeah, I think sometimes in, they'll say like, oh, you know, uh, it's one more thing. I'm not going to give that to my teachers right now. Um, and we totally understand that. And I guess we kind of pick our battles too, as far as where we need to push and where we don't push. Um, because once, you know, once the emotion wears off, usually they can see that it would be a good thing in the long run to do like another booster or to, you know, spend 45 minutes in the morning for two weeks going over certain skills. Um, and generally the admin is very supportive with that and supportive of their teachers with that. Um, do you use a curriculum for social skills groups? We don't use a specific curriculum district wide now. I know a lot of districts do do that. Um, previously, I've used specific curriculums. Um, I know like some of them do like peacemakers, things like that. So I feel like each, each school kind of has their own thing. Um, and that's decided upon with the administration and um, like school counselors, things like that. They usually, they usually will run that. Um, but as far as for me, when I go in to support the social skills groups, usually I'm taking those students that are more like the tier, high tier two, tier three students. So that's more targeted. So I know specific skills that they need to work on. Um, so it's really just more explicit instruction in that. Um, modeling, having them do it, going back into the classroom and then modeling it there and that sort of thing. Are there other questions? I know I have a couple more questions, but I want to make sure that I give people a chance. Are there other questions? Um, feel free to unmute or, or put in the chat. Um, Shannon, you mentioned that you've worked both at, as a building coach and, and now in your role as a district coach. Mm -hmm. um, from your perspective, are there pros and cons of the district coach? And um, I guess is the, you know, what has been the general impact of putting in the district coaching role? I think that generally the district coach serves as a big support to the building coaches. I know when I was a building coach, I always felt like I was like the one that had to have the answer to everything. And that was kind of you know, that's hard to swallow sometimes, depending on the other role that you're doing day in and day out. So it's always nice to have another person to fall back on, I feel like. So I think that's a good, a good thing for our schools that they have myself and my boss, Rachel, to do the same thing and really just answer questions. And then two, it's a streamline of information. So I speak, like we said, I speak to the DCIU facilitator the information goes through us and then gets fed into the schools. Um, I guess for a con, like I had mentioned previously, it's just learning every building and all of their little details and intricacies and um, who does what. And, you know, when you have probably four or 5,000 kids in the district, it's, it's a lot to, to swallow. But at the same time, I think like I said before, being that support to your, you know, teams within the building makes up for that. Um, and the more you dive into it, I really think it's easier to learn as well. Um, but I do, having worked before without a district coach, I do think the district coach model is better just because it gives support to the, your buildings um, in a more personal manner. Anyway. Is your role solely district coached? Um, no. So my other role is a behavior manager. So essentially I go into the classroom um, and work with 
specific students, specific teachers um, as a resource just to help with behavioral interventions. And that could be with special ed students or those not identified or in the process of being identified. Um, I do have some, some discussions here and there too with students that are out of district placements as well. And then piggybacking on the previous question, are your tier one coaches typically classroom teachers? Generally, yes. However, we have a couple counselors as well that serve as the tier one coach. Um, for example, kindergarten center, their tier one coach is the counselor. However, within the last couple months, um, with, inner, with putting in the tier two, within our buildings, she's since moved. I know, I know, I, know coach, I saw it and in we've had one. a teacher take over the tier one. Um, and then besides direct services to students, what would you say your most important activities are that you do as a district coach? Probably just like making them feel like a team, like we're all, all together. Um, and I really enjoy doing the monthly meetings with all of the schools because I feel like it's always positive. They're always giving each other feedback. They're always giving each other ideas. Um, and because there's six schools, six different ways of doing it, um, they're hearing all these different ways of doing it every month. And how is this one doing a booster? How are this is the are these ones teaching their lessons? Um, so I think that's probably the best part of it for me is to just kind of bring them all together and let them know that, hey, you're not alone. There's plenty of other people for you to talk to and um, complain with or whatever's needed at the time. Um, so I found that some districts are wary about identifying a district coach due to time involved and previous reliance on external facilitator. How would you address this? So, Part of my actual job description is being the district coach. So I think that would have to probably fall on the administration as far as when they're identifying that coach. Um, since I think that it would probably be too much for just maybe a teacher to do, I just think that that would be too much. Um, so it would have to be maybe somebody with a little bit more like behavioral expertise or um, like a psychologist or somebody that would be willing to do that that's maybe already across buildings because my role is already across buildings it kind of naturally falls into that um and then as far as like relying on the external facilitator i be i do i i, I think because i understand how pbis works and generally try to stay up on like pbis news and how that stuff works that i don't rely too much on our DCIU facilitator, more so just if I have a question about like Swiss or, or you know, a universal screening or something like that. But um, as, a, as a whole, you know, I think that would probably be the most difficult thing or important, I should say. Um, When primarily focusing on the tier one phase, how have your schools used behavioral referrals? So they each, our entire district uses SPIS. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, it's like an online way of putting in uh, behavioral referrals. And the good thing about SWIFTS is that it's very easy to run graphs and very easy to look at patterns. Um, so you can see very simple, within a few seconds, to be honest with you, as far as clicks, whether it's like a systems issue or if it's, you know, is it three students that are the issue? Is it four students that are the issue? Um, if a specific grade necessary, might necessarily need, you know, a little bit of a booster. I know, I think, the, I think it was in October in one of our schools, the data was coming out that the first grade was having, a, you know, a little bit more issues as far as keeping their hands to themselves. Um, so the teachers took it upon themselves to rerun lessons for a week um, instead of doing, like they were using their morning meeting time to do the lessons um, and just teach this stuff more explicitly. 
So I think that's probably a good way to be using the like referrals uh, that way. Um, and I know every school does that. So they all pull, pull the data and look at it that way at their monthly meetings in the universal meeting. And what I do like to tell them too, if you're discussing specific students within a tier one uh, meeting, that's a different meeting. You need to, if you're discussing specific students that needs to be pushed to either tier two or, you know, just like a general teaming uh, about that student. So the universal meeting should be focused on your systems, your grades that may be having issues. Um, if in general, the school might be having concerns within the cafeteria. So those are the things that should be discussed at the, at the tier one level. How often are your building level meetings? So we, I run a district wide meeting once a month and each building does at least one monthly meeting for themselves too. Sometimes we'll have other meetings just as kind of like a meetings of the minds to try to, to, to get more ideas and just spruce things up within the building. But generally it's once a month for both. Um, when are they able to find time that all members are available? About how many representatives does each team have? So, hello, hello. Okay, so finding time they they meet after school. So the hours are eight to three thirty. Students leave between like two thirty five, two forty five. So generally the meetings are from three to three thirty. Um, our PBIS coaches do get an extra like lump sum within their salary too, because the admin does recognize that they're taking on more, more work. So that is an incentive as well. And then how many representatives does each team have? So again, that's dependent on how big the school is. So, um, for example, the kindergarten has a smaller team, like four people versus a Glen Olden um, or a high school that could have between 10 to 15 representatives. Um, so really it's just dependent on how many students you have. There's no set rule, but um, I would think you would probably want, want at least you know four to five. That way you can divvy up the, the roles and the duties as well. Uh, what what do the schools use for universal screeners? So again, not all of our schools do universal screeners. Some of them do. They do the um, the SRSS. There's there's many options out there. Um, and I actually consulted with the DCIU facilitator for that reason, just as far as which one they've heard is the best. Um, so we do the one that focuses on both the external and the internal. Um, behaviors and you know they have a rule that if you screen you must intervene so if you are screening you have to make sure that you're ready to intervene as well um, for example our kindergarten center the universal screener came out I think it was like 60 percent of the kids were were in need which generally that would be a systems issue as far as like oh you have to go back and relook at your tier one universal program. However, between looking at that and the Swiss data, so our behavioral referral data, we kind of talked it up to these are pandemic kids. They've been raised in a pandemic. Um, so we really just beefed up our social skills. And we've been doing that now, I think, for eight weeks. And it's, it's made a, a big difference. So myself and the school counselor has been, have been running those together. And then are you using the SRSS? Yes, that's what they've been using, the SRSS EI for the external and internal. And you can get copies of that right online. Um, fairly simple Google search, you'd be able to find it. But again, um, before you start using that, make sure that the administration is on board with that because at times it gives you wonderful information, but um, it's not the type of information that you can really sit on. So as a team administration, you would wanna be ready to intervene with 
students that really needed it. <clears throat> Are you addressing with classroom social, emotional, or small groups? Both. So I do full group instruction in certain classes, and then I also do small groups. So I'll do groups as you know, as small as one to one. Um, and then with our kids that then are able to bring in other kids, there could be um, two other students with me, three other students, four other. Um, I think the biggest right now that I have is 15 kids that I do together. Right, and it looks like Ron shared the Padlet in the chat. Yep. I had just been requested um, for the link to the Padlet. Some people had closed that, closed it out, so um, repopulated that. Other questions for um, Shannon or for Innerborough on the district coaching model? Shannon, one of the things that I'm always interested in, and, and you touched upon this just a little bit, that some of the building, they've maintained their autonomy. So some of them are using um, some different universal screeners. It sounds like everybody is pretty much using Swiss. Um, are there any other common data points that you're finding very valuable either at the building or the district-wide level right now? I do think Swiss is honestly worth every penny um, from having come from other placements where things were handwritten and turned in and then put into a system and then things that were used. Then uh, we had like QR codes and stuff like that. I do think Swiss is definitely worth, worth the investment. It's actually not that expensive to be honest with you. Um, but I, I think that that's great. It's very user friendly. It's extremely easy to put in a referral because I know that that's often a deterrent for people to, to just not put in the data because it's, you know, cumbersome and Swiss is not like that at all. You can put one in within, within a minute. Um, and then I do think the universal screeners are certainly helpful. I understand why not all, all of our schools do that because they just don't necessarily have the support right now. Um, to you know, intervene with more social skills or tier two, tier three interventions at this point. But I do think that that's helpful um, and kind of, especially with the kids that are more internal, um, I think it's easy for us to focus on the kids that are demonstrating the external behaviors because they're the ones that are flipping chairs or cursing out our teachers. But I think, focusing on the kids that have more the more internal anxiety, depression type behaviors as well should be equally as important. And Joe just shared in the chat and 100% um, attendance is huge this year as a data source. Yes, mm -hmm. I think attendance is big too. Um, that's something that they really focus on within like the SAP meeting. So they're always looking at attendance. Um, I feel like they're big on that here. <laughs> they're very big at sending somebody to the house or calling or truancy. <laughs> um, just because the times that we're in, sometimes families need extra support and they don't know how to reach out for it or they're embarrassed to do it. And just kind of giving the families that extra support, like, hey, we are here, what else, what can we do for you? Um, really helps. And attendance is a, is definitely huge this year. I would have to agree with you. And I, I think for you, for people who aren't familiar with Inner Borough, and Shannon, you can correct me, Inner mm -hmm. Borough um, borders the Philadelphia um, School District and or is close enough that yeah. you do see some transition of students between Philadelphia to you and back to Philadelphia? Yeah, there's definitely a large transient population. There's also a larger homeless population. Um, most of our students qualify for, well, I know it's free for everyone this year, but in, the, in years past, the free and reduced lunch. Um, so it's generally a lower socioeconomic status type of district. Um, so that is probably why they are, are very big on 
attendance as well. Um, and just being, I mean, I'm in meetings all the time where they just pick up the phone and call the parents and have a very open communication. And I think that helps too. I think the parents feel supported um, <clears throat> when they're able to just call their district level administrator and you know have a conversation. Okay. All right. We use the Swiss system for PBIS data. Our school system is CSIU. There are certain ODRs, so office dis discipline referrals that have to be put into both systems. Do you know if there is a way to link them so the info only has to be put into one system and will automatically transfer? I was in a training where someone thought Swiss linked, but some school system with some school systems, but not sure how to do that. To be honest with you, I am not sure how to do that. Um, I can jump in on that. Um, okay. I'm not 100% sure, but Swiss is a standalone um, yeah. program under PBIS apps, which comes actually out of University of Oregon. So okay. it would depend on the individual um, system that your school is using. I'm not 100% sure what I've heard of people doing is they will input into one system and then run a report. And based on that report, the entry is done into the other system. But I'm um, that would be something that like your school system would have to talk to the Swiss system to determine yeah. how to link that. Yeah, there. I mean, Swiss has a lot of IT resource people there so that you know, you could probably just um, email them. Um, I can try to, I can actually try to find it for you and put it into the, into the chat before I log off. And then I have been in two different districts using Swiss and neither has been able to link the student information system. Okay, used in those. Yeah, I feel like Interboro used to have both and then they just gravitated towards just using Swiss. So again, that would probably be like an admin decision to just I can tell you 100% that it does not link with Skyward just because the district that I came from before joining Patton had Skyward. So I know 100% that it does not link with Skyward. And Justin, thank you for sharing that um, link in the chat about um, data integration in Swiss. Um, you will find sometimes that some of the uh, school um, record keeping systems can either do the equivalent of Swiss or can um, be upgraded to be able to do some of those things in Swiss. And other systems have just been found, you know, it's, it's worth the money for Swiss, so. <laughs> Um, I am putting in the email actually for their IT department now. And I, I email this, this support at pbisapps.org um, with any type of information regarding Swiss that I just can't figure out within the manual. And they're generally very receptive and responsive. I know some systems play more nicely with Swiss than others, but I remember what I remember from my training is that sometimes the student data can be pulled over to Swiss, but I don't think office discipline referrals can. Oh, and then somebody said they hear from me weekly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can relate. So are there other questions for Shannon about the um, district model um, implementing at either the building or um, district level um, or anything else, just kind of, we've got a couple minutes, but you know, if there's nothing there, I won't hold you, but I certainly wanna give you time to ask questions. I'll put my email into the chat again, that way you can always shoot me an email. And I will be sure to, uh, um, post our um, visual to the Padlet. And I will also, um, like I said, this session is being recorded and there will be an email blast 
um, in about a week or so when everything is, um, we go through everything to filter stuff out <laughs> um, of the recordings, but um, once everything has been edited and posted, there will be an email blast with links to everything. Um, oh, here's a great question. How are the middle grades five through eight with tier one incentives? How is buy-in? What rewards incentives do they tend to gravitate towards? That is a good question. So middle school is not notoriously um, difficult to have incentives for. Um, so what our <laughs> schools have done is actually hot Cheetos, that's true. And um, so yeah, food is generally a big thing for them. They'll, they love, they have like a candy bar that, that we do in some of the schools. So that's a big incentive for them. Um, the Chick-fil-A lunches that we've done are a big incentive for them. Um, so generally food <laughs> um, or extra like recess time, things like that. But what I do suggest is actually polling your students. So instead of trying to guess what they actually want, ask them, ask them what they want. Um, and they will be very honest with you, especially the middle schoolers. And um, you can be very honest with them. You know, I've had kids say, oh, well, we want to be able to win an Xbox. Well, clearly that's not something that we're gonna be giving as an Xbox to everybody. Um, so poll your students, that would be my suggestion. But for us, candy, hot Cheetos, Chick-fil-A, stuff like that works. But that's something that they've, that they've um, told us in polls. Food and freedom, yep. David, would you um, unmute and if you can and share what PAX is? I'm not familiar with that as an incentive. Absolutely. Um, it's a program that I've used uh, previously uh, in my previous years of teaching in Maryland. It's all based around trying to focus rewards and incentives on intrinsic uh, okay. activities as opposed to extra, extrinsic like, you know, uh, candy or, or items. Um, so you give the class the opportunity to um, have a uh, solid reading block or, or center time where you set the expectations. And then if they earn a reward, it's a 30 second game of heads up, seven up, or it's a one minute go noodle. It's something active, physically active. Um, and in the upper grades, obviously it's more challenging because you have to figure out uh, the active activities that may draw them in. Sometimes it can be a minute or two to do a quick game on their uh, devices or something like that, but it's an activity that ties their um, reward to their kind of mental, okay, I'm going to focus to get this reward. Uh, it's just something I've had experience using before. That's great. Thank you. I have to look into that because I haven't heard of that. Um, a couple comments about using student amb ambassadors. Yes. Um, some of our schools, like I said, each school runs it differently. So some of our schools do have like a, um, like a student PDIS team and they do a lot of that. They do poll their students, um, but that's my number one suggestion is to just ask the kids. They are usually very honest with you. And Amanda shared that, you know, sometimes you might have to give them examples of what would yeah. be appropriate. Like you said, you know, obviously you can't give away an Xbox to them, you mm -hmm. know, so what is a real, you know, helping them to kind of frame what a realistic motivator would be. Um, there's also, I suggest, um, I don't know if any of you ever heard of her. Her name's Laura Riffle. Um, I can put that website in there too. I think she has like a hundred pages on free or low cost incentives um, that you could go through. I, I think it would take you, I've read through it a few times, but it takes a long time to read through them all. But it kind of gets your brain going too, to like think outside the box. Um, let me find that website for you. And I'm, I'm actually popping it okay. in right now. Okay, perfect. Um, there you go. Laura Riffle is a, um, she's the, I think the behavior guru, guru yep. behavior doctor. She is a great friend to um, Pennsylvania. We've had her speak many times. Um, and if I remember correctly, I believe that she's going to be at next year's forum. Yeah, I I was able to hear her speak, and she's she's amazing. So. And I guess it was two thousand nineteen, the PBIS forum. 
I get kids interest surveys. There's a lot online. Yep. But yeah, behaviordoctor.org, there's lots of resources on there. And like I said, I think like 100 pages of low cost or free incentives. Right. <clears throat> um, last call for any questions, um, discussion, chat, anything like that on the district model, um, anything like that. I, I can't take thank Shannon enough for being here, for just sharing openly, no, for being willing just to answer questions too. I, I think this has been a great, um, a great opportunity. So um, I am going to pop the link to the Padlet in the chat again. I've got too many screens open here. <laughs> um, we have just a couple more minutes to this session. Um, there is a short break between this session. Our, our third uh, breakouts begin at 11.30. Um, I've shared the link to the Padlet back in the chat. Um, so you can pop back there to see the sessions on today's agenda. Um, but um, I'll leave the room open if there's any further questions, but otherwise I'm going to stop the recording and thank you everybody for joining and um, have a great day. Thank you.